Please take your Bibles now and turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. I had a lot of fun reading through this uh, chapter and thinking about a a sermon, but uh, look at verse 31. Matthew 14, verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? The title of the sermon tonight is, Thou of little faith. And I think these words could be said to any of us at different points in our life. I'm sure there's been points in our life where we've had doubts. You know, is God going to come through for us? Is God going to answer this prayer? And as, as Jesus Christ says, says these words to Peter, I can just imagine Jesus Christ saying these words to me sometimes when I've had a little faith or maybe to yourself. So what I really want to look at today as we, as we get through maybe the second half of this chapter is to think about how can we increase our faith? How can we make sure that we remain faithful to the Lord and see it through? So let's uh, pick it up from verse number one there, Matthew 14, verse one. It says there, at the time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus. Now, Herod the Tetrarch, guys, that's not the same Herod which tried to kill Jesus Christ as a little baby. If you guys remember that, that Herod then, Herod the Great, he's known as, he, he um, remember uh, God warned Joseph to go into Egypt to escape, you know, the, 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 the murderous attempts of Herod. But when Herod died, that's when God called Joseph and Mary to come back out of Egypt and go back into the land of Canaan. So this Herod of Tetrarch is actually one of Herod the Great's son, sons, okay? After Herod the Great passed away, uh, four of his sons looked after the same area that he had. That's why this Herod is known as Herod the Tetrarch, just to differentiate from Herod the Great that we know about. But look, he heard the fame of Jesus. Look at verse number two. And said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore mighty works to show forth themselves in him. So you see, uh, uh, Herod the Tetrarch knew John the Baptist. In, in fact, when he hears about Jesus, he goes, well, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. You see, Herod here knew about the resurrection of the saints. And you say, well, what does that mean? How, how does he know that? It's because Herod took a lot of time listening to the preaching of John the Baptist. We'll have a look at this shortly. But Herod the Tetrarch, for me, has always been an interesting figure in the Bible. He's had so much truth revealed unto him. He, he knew who the real prophets of God were, and yet he still rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It's such a sad story for Herod here. But let's keep reading verse number 3. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So let's understand this. Herod the Tetrarch arrested John the Baptist and put him into prison. Okay, And the reason why he did that was because John the Baptist preached against Herod for taking his brother Philip's wife. He had committed adultery but how bad is it to commit adultery, adultery with your sister-in-law? You know, he took her as his wife and John the Baptist preached against him. And Herodias, it says he, he was put in prison for Herodias' sake. Herodias is, is, the, is the wife. She's the one that demanded, hey, arrest John the Baptist. Hey, you know, kill John the Baptist. But you see here that uh, Herod feared the multitude because the multitude saw John the Baptist as a prophet. Now, keep your finger there and turn to Mark chapter 6, please. Turn to Mark chapter 6. Because I want to show you how interesting Herod is in the Bible. Mark chapter 6, verse 18. And there's there's a big warning for all of us. A big warning for all of us in the life of Herod here. But Mark chapter 6, verse 18. Let's get a different angle to the same story. It says here, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing, look at this, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy and observed him. And when he had heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. You see, even after Herod had arrested John the Baptist, you know, he knew he was a just man. He knew he was a holy man. He knew John the Baptist was preaching the truth. Okay. And it says here that he gladly, he observed him and gladly heard him. You know, this was in prison. So Herod would go to prison to see John the Baptist and hear him preach. 
Okay, this is such an interesting, this is why I'm saying it's interesting. It's because Herod had, knew that John the Baptist was a prophet of God, knew that he was a righteous man, and gladly heard the preaching. That's such a sad thing that Herod still rejected Jesus Christ. Now, let's turn to Luke 23, please. Let's have a look at this. Luke 23, verse 8. Luke 23, verse 8, where we're fast forwarding a little bit now to the end of the ministry of Jesus Christ. After Jesus Christ was arrested and before his crucifixion, if you remember the story, he was brought before Herod the Tetrarch. Okay, Jesus Christ was brought before Herod the Tetrarch. Look at this in Luke 23, verse 8. Luke 23, verse 8. It says, And when Herod saw Jesus, look, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him for a long season. This means Herod's been wanting to see Jesus Christ for a long time. He's finally, he finally sees Jesus now. Because because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. So this guy even knows that Jesus Christ can do miracles. He's hoping to see Jesus Christ perform a miracle before his eyes. And then it says here, Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. You see, uh, Herod asked Jesus Christ many questions. But how did Jesus respond? He answered him nothing. Jesus did not respond to Herod. Verse number 10, And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Look at this, verse 11, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. You see, he wanted Jesus Christ to perform a miracle. He wanted Jesus Christ to preach. You know, he knew he was a legitimate preacher once again. He knew Christ could perform miracles in the same way with John the Baptist. He knew he was a legitimate prophet of God. But what happens when Jesus does not respond to him, does not answer his questions? He rejects Christ. He mocks Christ. You know, mockingly puts that robe upon him and sends him back to Pilate. Now you might say, well, it's a little bit unfair, Jesus. Why didn't you answer um, uh, the questions from Herod? Now, if you guys don't mind, go back to Mark, please. Mark chapter 8. You guys were in Mark 64. Go to Mark chapter 8. So we just, we just want to get the answer of Jesus Christ. Why would he not speak to Herod? Okay, Mark 8 verse 15. Mark 8 verse 15. These are the words of Jesus Christ. It says here, And he charged them, saying, Take heed, listen. That's what he means. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Sorry, of the, sorry, where is it? <laughs> Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Now, a lot of you guys have heard that saying. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. But, and I'm sure you've heard preaching on that. But have you ever heard about the leaven of Herod? What is the leaven of Herod? What, what is this false idea that Herod was teaching? Well, here's the thing about Herod. Herod was so close to the truth. Herod knew the preachers of God. Herod had the truth preached at him. But what is his leaven? That he rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, even knowing full well the truth of everything that was presented to him. And I, this is the warning that I want to tell you guys, especially for children. Okay, children, pay attention to me. Children that have been going to church, you've been going to church maybe for a long time. You grow up into church, you hear preaching, you know the pre what the preacher is saying is true. You know it's from the Bible, but you're still not ready to receive Christ. You might put that on the back burner and say, no, look, one day, someday, one day, I'm going to believe on Christ. I'm happy to be in church. I'm happy to hear the preaching. I know it's true, but you know what? I'm, I'm going to hold off now. I'm not going to put my faith in Christ just yet. That's something that I can do at an older age. No. Hey, beware of the leaven of Herod. That was Herod's problem. He had everything available to him. He had, the, he had preachers available to him. He knew they preached the truth, and he still rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard for me to wrap my head around that because I think if I'm being offered the free gifts, if I'm being told eternal life, I'll be like, I want it. Give it to me. But you see, Herod, it's like, no, you know, it, it, it didn't fall in his plans. He wanted to see a miracle of Christ, but did not receive that miracle. So I just wanted to show you that beware of the leaven of Herod. Children, I've seen, I've, I've been in church my whole life and, and I see children grow up in church hearing great preaching and then by the time they're, you know, 16, 17, 18, they're out of church, you know, um, they, don't want, they don't want to have anything to do with God. You know, that's the leaven of Herod. You've, you've got to be careful, okay? Because you know what? Sometimes the teaching can be so familiar. You know it all. You know, you think, well, I know all this stuff, okay? And, but you're missing the most important ingredient. That's being born again by, by being born uh, of the Spirit. So let me just turn this off. 
Otherwise, it's going to distract me. All right. All right, let's uh, go back to Matthew chapter 14, please. Matthew chapter 14. Now, something else that gets asked a lot um, to me that I've been asked many times is, when you look at the Old Testament prophets, now, if you know John the Baptist, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And if you look at all the Old Testament prophets, one of their major ministries was preaching against the authorities, preaching against the kings, preaching against the, pre the priests when they have failed in their duties. I'm sure you can all relate. If you've read the Old Testament, you know that's a huge chunk of the Old Testament. Just God sending prophets, calling out wicked kings, calling out wicked priests, you know, calling out wicked pastors. You know, and, and we see this. John the Baptist is the, is the last Old Testament prophet. And there he, he is once again calling out Herod. You know, for, for committing adultery, for taking his brother's uh, wife for himself. The question comes, should we as, as pastors, as preachers, New Testament preachers, should we also be, you know, uh, uh, you know calling out our, 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 you know, our premiers and our prime ministers and the Queen of England or whatever? Should we be doing that in the New Testament? Now, anyway, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, I don't think there's anything wrong to do that. Okay, there's, there's a lot of wicked politicians. We have a lot of wicked leadership in our country. I don't think there's anything wrong in of itself. We take the example that we see of the prophets of old preaching against you know, the, the leaders of the nation. But here's something that you, you need to understand that's very different between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The reason the prophets were called to you know, many times preach against the leadership is because Old Testament Israel had a covenant with God himself. You know, God had a covenant with those people, with that nation, that he would be their God. And if they stopped obeying the commands of God, if they started to follow after false gods, that God would curse them. And quite often when, they would fall, when that would happen, that's when God would send his prophets to preach against them, to get the nation back on track. Okay? But if the nation as a whole kept the commandments of God, God will bless them. God will you know, keep them safe in that land, will protect them from their enemies, and so on and so forth. But you see, in Australia, we, we don't have that anymore. Australia does not have a covenant with God. The United States does not have a covenant with God. We've got the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. We've got the New Testament. Okay? And under the New Testament, what's more important than a physical nation is that spiritual nation. The spiritual nation you know, of, of God's people. You know? And that's why the Bible says that judgment begins in the house of God. You know, more important than me calling out some prime minister for their sins, what's more important is that we preach to the church. The judgment is in our church that we challenge one another in the sins, in, 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 the, in the weaknesses that we have, and that we, we mature and we grow understanding the spiritual truths that we have in the Word of God. So I'm, I'm just saying that because that, that's a question that gets asked of me. Should we be like the Old Testament prophets? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm not going to say that's wrong, but our focus today is primarily in the local New Testament church, not in the nation so much because God does not have a covenant with the nation of Australia. Okay, That was something special for the nation of Israel back in the Old Testament days. But let's go back to Matthew 14 verse 6. Matthew 14 verse 6. But when Herod's birthday was kept, so it's Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. So the word charger is just a, another word for a, a, a dish, like a big dish. You know, and, and the demand of the, the daughter of Herodias was to have the head of John the Baptist on that dish, beheaded. Verse number 9, And the king was sorry. Why do you think he was sorry? We've sort of seen what he was like. He knew John the Baptist was a just man. You know, and of course he was sorry. He doesn't want to kill John the Baptist. It says, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. So the only thing that I want to point out here, guys, is that this is the end of the Old Testament prophets. John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet. Why is that important? Because now Jesus Christ at his death would bring in the new covenant in his blood. Okay? The, the, the next prophet, as it were, to die in that sense would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And his death would usher in that New Testament, the new covenant. Verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, 
they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Now, this is something that's interesting about Jesus. He hears about the death of John the Baptist, you know, his cousin, the one who baptized him, the one that was the forerunner that prepared a generation for the Lord Jesus Christ. He hears about the death of John the Baptist, and you can see that it moved Christ, that it caused him to depart into a desert place. He went somewhere quiet. He needed some peace. He needed somewhere to, uh, time to think, you know, and, and to, you know, uh, I guess be re-encouraged once again. I'm sure he went out to pray. And, but even though he was, he was uh, sorrowing the death of his cousin, you see that this great multitude came and followed after Christ. Now, I love verse 14 because notice there in verse 14, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. Now, I don't know if you have compassion for the lost. Can, I mean, don't show me a show of hands, but can you honestly tell me I have a compassion for the lost? I, 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 I'm saddened for those that do not know Christ as a Savior. I'm saddened for those that have not heard the gospel. Maybe you do. Maybe a little bit. Maybe if you're honest, you might even say, actually, I don't. I don't have that compassion. Well, I think the ingredients are here in verse 14. How do you gain that compassion for the lost? And I can relate to this. I can relate to this a lot because look at verse 14. It says, and Jesus went forth. Okay. So the first thing we notice is that Jesus went. Okay. He went out. And then it says, and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. What's the process? What's the first thing that Jesus did? He went forth. Right. He saw the multitude. What's the next thing? Then he was moved with compassion. Then he healed their sick. Now, you and I, we don't have the power to heal the sick, but we do have the power to preach the gospel. Okay? And the healing that comes from preaching the gospel by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is much greater than physical healing, right? And having your soul healed, having your soul saved for all eternity is much more important than some temporal ailment that you suffer with. Okay? So we do have a task to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the sick as it were. That is to preach the gospel. But notice here, what we're required to do if we want to follow off the steps of Christ is to first go forth. Now let me tell you a story about myself. Before I started going soul winning, before I started going door to door soul winning, I thought I had a compassion for the lost. I thought, okay? It wasn't until I went forth it wasn't until I started knocking doors. It wasn't until I started to hear what other people, lost people were saying about going to heaven. They were trusting in being a good person. They were trusting in their church. They were trusting in, you know, that God would just be merciful for whatever reason. And, and, and when I started to hear the stories, and then I started to see people that really wanted to know what they must do to be saved, guess what, what happened to me? I started to be moved by compassion. Okay? But no, I, I, was, I was kind of waiting for the compassion to come first. It's like, well, now that I have the compassion, now I'm going to go and preach the gospel. But no, actually, what, ha what happened was I had to go and knock doors without compassion. Then I saw the multitude, seeing what they, were, what they needed, and then I was moved by compassion. I'm not sure if some of you guys can relate to that, but I said that was a significant part of my life to realize I had to do something first, and then I was moved by compassion. And then once you're moved by compassion, then you can heal the sick, as it were, preach the gospel to them, see them saved. And this is something similar with our relationships, husbands and wives. If, if you feel that, you know, you, you got into a point in your life where you just don't have the same love for your wife, you don't have the same love for your husband like you used to, you know, you, you're waiting for this emotion to come your way. You know, those feelings that you first had when you first met, that first date you went out on. You know what? Sometimes you just need to go forth. You, you just need to look after your spouse, look after your wife, look after your husband, provide their needs. And what you'll find is that love will come back when you start caring for that person, when you start doing things for that person, when you start investing time and effort into that relationship, that's when the love is going to come back. You know, it's not waiting for the love, then I'll do my part. No, you do your part and the love, the compassion, the emotions will come out of your actions. Okay, it's a very similar thing to what we see here in Jesus Christ. Verse number 15, please. Verse 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. So the word victuals just means food. All right? They're in the desert. There's a multitude. The Bible later on tells us how many were there. There were 5,000 men, just men. But then there were women and children as well. Right? There could have easily been 10,000 people 
you know, listening to Christ, following after Christ at this point. But we're given the numbers of 5,000 men here. Okay. Now what you'll notice is it's a desert place. Now if you're one of the disciples of Christ and you knew the people were starting to get hungry, you knew it's starting to get late, I think it's reasonable to think, hey Jesus, let's send them away so they can get some food. You know? But what we see here is that this is actually a lack of faith on the disciples. They're thinking, we cannot provide for this group. We cannot provide for this multitude. Okay? But they're with the Son of God. They're with Jesus Christ, who they've seen perform amazing miracles. And it's amazing because it's like Jesus here proves to them that He can provide every need. This is why it's so important for us to, to look at here. And uh, let me just uh, quickly read to you from Mark eleven twenty three. You don't need to turn there. It says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, look at this, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe, and, re and ye receive them, and ye shall have them. You see, Jesus Christ, when there's a need for us, right now there's a need of 5,000 people to be fed, but you're going to go through times in your life when you have a great need, when, when you need the Lord to provide for you, okay? What does the Bible say we need to do? It says we need to pray to the Lord, right? Without doubting, you know, pray with all our faith to the Lord, knowing that He's going to provide our needs. And it says we'll have them. I mean, I'm sure we all have stories of, of having a need praying to the Lord, and then Him coming through for us and providing our every need. You, you might be in a position right now where you have a great need. You might be in a position right now where you have some doubts. Is God going to provide for me? Is, gonna, is it God going to find a way? You know, well, what does the Bible say? Pray. Pray and don't have doubts and He will answer that prayer. But the story that we have here, guys, is this 5,000 men without food, this great need that there was. Let's keep reading verse 16. But Jesus said unto them, they, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. <laughs> I love that about Jesus, right? They don't need to go. You give them food. The disciples are like, what? We, we want to send them away so they can get some food. Jesus says, no, you know, give them the food that you've got here. All right, verse 17. And they said unto him, but, uh, said unto him we have here but five loaves and two fishes. That's all they have, guys. Five loaves of breads and two fishes to feed it at least 10,000 people, you know, on the day, all right? Verse 18, he said, bring them hither to me. So here's what I want you to understand. When you have a need, okay, and you might, you might be in a financial need right now, all right? You need to pray to the Lord. You need to go to Jesus Christ. He can provide for you. But what you need to do, guys, is to take your five loaves and your two fishes. You say, what's well, not enough? Hey, you've got to take what you have. You've got to do what you have. You've got to play your role. You know, you know, offer it to Jesus Christ and we'll see, soon see that Jesus Christ can multiply that. Jesus Christ can feed the multitudes. Okay? But we need to have faith that you know, Jesus Christ can come through. Look at verse 19. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. So this is a great example of Christ. Before we partake of food, before we partake of a meal, you see, once again, he, Jesus Christ, blessing the food. You know, so we, you know, you know, thanksgiving for the food that Christ, that God has provided for us. You see, even though it's not enough, we see Jesus Christ still being thankful for the five loaves and the two fishes. Verse number number twenty. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained, 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. All right. So we see how Jesus Christ was able to perform an amazing miracle. Somehow those loaves, those fishes were multiplied. Somehow everybody was able to eat to the point that there remained 12 baskets full. And, I, and I, the reason I believe there are 12 full baskets you know, is, is, is for one for each of the apostles, one for each of the disciples that were asking Jesus, hey, send the multitudes away. They were all left with one basket each, you know, full of bread, full of fishes. You see, God cannot, does not just provide your every need, but God can provide in abundance. Quite often when God provides, He provides more than you need, you know, more than you need. And it's such a blessing when you see God come through, 
You know, and look, we serve a living God. We serve a God who loves us. And if you're going through troubles, financial problems, whatever your needs are, hey, all, and all you've got are your five loaves and two fishes, well, then offer that to God. You know, you know, thank God for what you have. Do what you can. You know, pray to the Lord. Don't doubt and he'll come through for you. This is the promises that we see in the Bible. And again, once again, you know, I'm sure we've all had those experiences in our lives where God has come through. But you know what? We're also very weak. Our flesh is weak. So we, we, we've seen in the past when God's done things for us. But then today we might have problems and go, man, I don't know if God's going to do it. But he's done it for us before. This is why with the disciples, when you read the disciples in the New Testament, it's like they see these amazing miracles. And it's like, but you're still failing. Or you look at Israel of old. You know, God, you know, gets them through the Red Sea, the amazing miracles, the manna from heaven, and, you know, provides their food. And then they're still complaining. They're still whining. They're still disobeying God. It's like, why don't you get it? But we're, we're made of the same flesh and blood. You know, and I can understand when you may feel that God is far away, when you may feel that God's not providing. But look, we, we are not to doubt, okay? The, f the first thing we need to understand for us to increase our faith is to just remember that God will provide. Okay, God will provide. Not only can He provide, but He can provide in abundance. Okay, provide in abundance. That's the first lesson that you need to understand in order for your faith to be increased. And look, I often get asked the question, how did you, how did you manage on a single income, you know, to have 10 children? <laughs> I mean, people ask me all the time, like, how do you manage your finances? And honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just did what I knew I had to do. I just got a job, worked hard, paid the bills, tied to church, go to church, serve the Lord, read my Bible, ask God to provide, and somehow it happened. I can't tell you how. You know, I, I, I could say, yeah, I had five loaves and two fishes, but I gave that to the Lord, and somehow the Lord was able to multiply that. You know, I, I don't really have an answer to you how I've been able to, you know, especially down in Sydney, you know, have 10 children. We're now up in Queensland and, and provide, you know, going to Queensland and starting that church. I've not had a full-time job, you know, like a full-time paying job outside of being a church pastor for over a year now. So how's God provided? I don't know. <laughs> it's just, he's done it. Right? Okay, you know, obviously with our with labor, when I was 20 years old, the house, we built a granny flat in the back. That's our, you know, our provision, the rent that comes through. But look, all of that has been provided by God. You know, all of it's come from God. You know, not necessarily knowing how that was all going to come together, but I've seen how God can answer prayers, you know. And then, you know, down up, up there in, in uh, Queensland with our church, we were praying for the Lord to provide a building. I don't know if I've told you this story before, but when we calculated how much do we need to pay for a building, to have our own building, to lease a building, we worked out how much we had per month, and we concluded, hey, we can get this building, but we're only going to be left with $50 at the end of the month. Okay, fifty dollars at the end of the month. And it's like, wow, that's going to be t tight, you know. But we got the building, and then it's like, ever since we got the building, the Lord's provided above and beyond. You know, we've had other people come to join the church. We had other, you know, amounts of offering that's come into the, to, you know, and we've been able to pro pay every month our, our our lease easily. We've we've plenty left over. It's like every time the need comes, you know, we, you pray to the Lord, you doubt not, you just take the steps that you need to, you know, even thinking, man, only fifty bucks left over. But it's like God knows He's there, you know. If you're doing the work of God, you're putting Him first, you're putting His kingdom first, the Lord will step in and provide, you know. And it's just like this church, New Life Baptist Church Sydney. I didn't know whether we could, I could be here every week. I didn't know we could afford flights every week, you know, but there was a need, wasn't there? There was a need and we wanted to serve the Lord. You know, we, we put this church, you know, we, we prayed for it, we put it in the hands of God and we've seen how God can provide. You know, it's come through. You know, we're soon we're going to need our own building. You know, and the Lord has provided a building for us. You know, at this point to Fairfield, He's provided this house for us so we can meet at different times as well. The Lord has always come through. And I have no doubt that when, when it's time for us to hire our own hall, that the Lord's going to provide our needs. I have no doubt. And I was telling Brother David, I bet you it's going to happen the week that we need it. Like the very week that we need a hall, I bet you that's when God's going to come through and provide for us. Because I've seen how God has worked through, uh, you know, the, the last few years. But does that mean I'm, I'm always full of faith? No, many times I'm still doubting. I'm like, God, are you going to come through for us? You know? But that's why we need to increase our faith. But we do need to do our part. It's not about just praying to the Lord and the Lord just stepping in and doing everything for you. No, 
You've got to do your part. You've got to serve the Lord. You've got to go to church. You've got to read your Bible. You need to go soul winning. You need to serve. You know, you need to work hard. You need to do all these things. Do your part. Offer your five loaves and your two fishes and let God multiply the rest of it and take care of the other things. Back in uh, Matthew, Matthew 14, please. Matthew 14, verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. So if you're not sure what the fourth watch of the night is, that's between 3 to 6 a.m. So, you know, about 3 a.m. in the morning, Jesus Christ is now walking on the water. Okay, and he sees the disciples struggling in their ship. It says the winds were contrary. The winds were, were, were taking them the opposite direction, which they were trying to get at. Jesus sees they starts walking on the sea. Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And let me say just very quickly, guys, is... You know, if you have fears, you know, a lot of people experience different fears. I remember as a child, I had the fear of the dark. You know, I remember having, you know, thinking there was a monster underneath my bed. You know, and when I would go to bed, I'd run and I'd jump on my bed because I was worried if I went slowly, like the monster would grab me and pull me out of the bed, you know. We all have fears. We grow out of those fears. You know, a few of my kids are afraid of the dark. Our parents, we might be afraid of not providing for our family. We might be afraid of not uh, raising our kids for the Lord, you know, for our kids to go into the world and, and destroy their lives. We all have different kinds of fears, right? But we need to remember that if we just set our eyes on the Lord, what does he say? You know, he says, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. You know, the best way to overcome fear in your life is to just remember the Lord Jesus Christ. You just call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he will deliver you from your fears. I'll tell you a quick story about my wife, Christina. Maybe you've heard this one before. But when she got saved, so my wife, Christina, she was a Roman Catholic. And she had all the statues, you know, in a room. She had all the pictures. She had all the um, rose, what do they call them? The rosary. Yeah, she had all that. She had all that stuff in the house. And uh, when she, you know, believed on Christ, she realized, I need to get rid of these statues, you know. And it, she had them all in her bedroom. She got rid of all of them. She got rid of them. I think she kept one picture of Jesus that she was kind of emotionally attached to for a little while. She got rid of it eventually. Uh, but uh, I, I remember I was speaking to her. She was, so I wasn't, you know, we, we were just um, we were kind of dating at that, at that time. And I remember speaking to her on the phone. And then all of a sudden, things went quiet. I was like, Christina, are you there? Like, quiet, you know. And then, I, you know, I don't know how long it took place. But she got back to me. She, she got on the phone. She goes, you won't believe what happened. I'm like, well, what happened? She says, you know, I was, I was just... Uh, I was, she had some music on while she was talking to me on the phone and then she heard some, uh, like a rumbling sound. And she was like, what's that? You know, she thought it was the music, she turned it off, she turned off the music and then it's like, and she could still hear the rumbling sound. And then she, she realized that her door, you know, her, the, her bedroom door was, was like vibrating, like uh, violently, violent, violently vibrating. And it, and it was, it was uh, twisting, like out of, out of shape. You know, it was, it was unnatural, unnatural she says. You know, this huge rumble. And she goes, the reason I went quiet is I was so afraid. I mean, have you ever been so afraid where you just freeze? Like you just don't know what's... That's what happened to her. She froze, you know. And I have no doubt that she was attacked spiritually during that time because she got rid of all that demonic stuff, all those demonic statues. And, and, you know, obviously the devil or whatever devils were there that were involved in that kind of worship weren't happy. You know, and they were trying to bring fear into, into Christina. And I said, well, what did you do? She goes, I just said, Jesus, help me. <laughs> That's the only thing that she could think of, Jesus, help me. And when she called out to Jesus Christ, it all stopped and she had peace. You know, and I've, I've never had that kind of experience. I mean, I've heard of other people having you know, similar kinds of experiences, especially when you're really involved in a false religion, you know, especially when you're, when you're involved in, in worshipping like dead idols, because those, that worship does go to a devil. Okay, I don't have time to cover that. But you see, even in times of fear, even in times of spiritual wickedness, in power, the powers of darkness, you know, all we need to do is call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Christ says here, you know, be of good cheer. You know, be not afraid. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse number, uh, where am I up to? Verse number 28. 
Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou be, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. So you see, Peter has come to accept that Jesus Christ can perform supernatural miracles. He sees Jesus Christ there walking on the water. He says, well, if it's you, Jesus, let me go in the water. I want to experience that. You know, Peter had the right idea. You know, he, 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 his faith was increased. You know, he was strengthened. He was of good cheer. He had seen Christ walking on the water. He goes, I want a piece of that. I want a piece of that adventure. I want to do that. So you see here, Peter now full of faith, isn't he? Calling out to Christ, full of faith. Verse 29. And he said, Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. What an amazing thing. Peter actually walked on water at this point. But I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, Jesus, Jesus said to him, come. So what do we see with Peter? That he was obedient, wasn't he? He was obedient to the call of Jesus Christ. And number two, as he walked on the water, it says uh, uh, to go to Jesus. You see, as he walked, he, was, uh, he set his sights on the Lord Jesus Christ. His focus was on Jesus Christ. He was obedient to Christ and he was seeking to follow after Christ. That's why Peter was able to perform such a great miracle himself. Obedience, following after Christ. And he was able to you know, walk on water. Verse number 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Why did Peter begin to sink? He saw here, he saw the winds, right? He saw the waves, he saw the winds. He got distracted. He took his eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ and started to look at the waters, started to look at the wind, and he began to fear. He began to doubt, and that's what caused him to sink. You know, what's the lesson that we can learn here, guys? Is that when we're looking for Christ to provide for our needs, what do we need to do? We need to be obedient and we need to set our eyes on Jesus Christ. We need to follow after His ways, okay? But if you get distracted by the troubles of life, you get distracted by the storms of life, that's when you go into doubt. That's when you're going to start to sink in your life, okay? That's when you're going to call out, Lord, save me! <laughs> you know, come rescue me, Lord! But I love this in verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth His hand and called Him. Immediately. You see, He did not want Peter to suffer. He didn't want Peter to drown. He was there to catch him, even in his times of doubts. And that's the same thing with Jesus Christ with us today, guys, is that even when we doubt, even when we're lacking faith, Jesus Christ is there to catch us, okay? And called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, I don't know about you guys. Have you ever walked on water? At least Peter did it. And he's calling Peter, thou of little faith. So how much less than <laughs> faith do we have? I mean, you know, we also like, you know, we are made of flesh and blood. Okay, we, we, we have the weaknesses of our, of, our, of our bodies and the weaknesses of our, of our, of our minds. But you see, when, when there's great faith, when you're following after the Lord, even miraculous things can happen. See, the Lord can provide supernaturally, miraculously for your life, you know. So the, what I want you to notice there, guys, is the second point to increasing your faith. You know, the first point was to, um, was to know and to believe that God can provide and provide abundantly. But point number two is to keep your eyes on Jesus through thick and thin. That's what's going to get you through your troubles. That's what's going to help, uh, you know, cause God to provide for your every need. Number, verse number 32. And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. That's a beautiful thing because as they were in the ship, you know, they, they were struggling with the storms, weren't they? They were struggling without Jesus Christ in the ship. But as soon as Jesus Christ enters the ship, what did it say in verse 32? The wind ceased. You see, when you're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're in close fellowship with Him, that's when the winds will cease. That's when you're going to have peace, even in, in times of necessity even in times of fear, even in times of troubles, if you're just close to the Lord Jesus, you're going to have the peace. And the winds will cease, okay, because the Lord is there with you. It's important for us to be in the presence of the Lord. And then verse 33, And when they were come in the ship, uh, ship came and worshipped Him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. See, so the third point that I want to bring up here, guys, to increase our faith, is that we are to worship God. Worship God. And here in church tonight, guys, we're here 
not to hear me necessarily, not to necessarily see one another, though those are things that are important. But we come to the house of God so we can worship God, so we can be in the presence of God. You see, when you're in church, you know, the Lord is here. The Lord is here in our midst, okay? And there's a peace here, isn't there? There's a peace of the Holy Ghost that's, that's within you know, the believers, within the brethren. The fellowship can be sweet. I'll just read to you. Actually, you guys can turn there, please. John 4.21. I'll get to turn to John 4.21. John 4.21. John 4.21, keeping your finger, sorry, there in the in, in book of Matthew. But John 4.21, this is Jesus speaking to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And he says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, sorry, ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is... When the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So what, one thing I want to not take away from this, guys, is that it's not about a place. It's not about going to Jerusalem. Like going to Jerusalem is not going to cause you to worship God more. It's not the mountains where, where the Samaritans would worship the Lord. That's not, it's not about the physical location. We can, we can worship God anywhere, okay? Because God is a spirit, but He asks us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. You see, the only ones that can actually worship God are those that are born of the Spirit, those that have the Holy Spirit indwelt in them. You know, those that are not, not saved, non believers, their worship to God is, is actually not worship because it's not done in the Spirit. But we also are to worship Him in truth. It's important to know the doctrines of the Bible. It's important to try to walk after His ways because that is a, 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 a part of our worship to Him. You know, we, we come to worship God. When you worship Him, your faith will be increased. Your faith will be increased because you are practicing a spiritual work which, 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 uh, which uh, works together with the Holy Ghost as you worship God the Father. But I want to read to you very quickly from Matthew 18 verse 20. Jesus Christ says, from where, uh, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Let me say to you, are there two or three here gathered in the name of Christ tonight? Absolutely, there's more than two or three <laughs> gathered here for the name of Christ. Then what does Jesus promise? That he'll be in the midst of us. You see, the reason church is called the house of God is because it's God's house. It's where God lives. It's where God is. And when we gather together for church, you know, you might go, oh man, church again this week. Hey, but well, you're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, this is the best place to come and worship Him. It's so much easier to worship God when we're gathered together with fellow believers. You know, it's harder to worship Him on your own. You know, it's harder to, to read your Bible, to pray on your own. But when you have other people together, you know, soul winning is hard on your own. But when you have other people encouraging yourselves, you know, they're counting on you to be there. You know, that's going to motivate you. That's going to get you to serve the Lord, to worship the Lord. So I just want to quickly just summarize those three things that we see in this chapter. What's going to increase your faith? Number one, believing that God can provide and that He can provide in abundance. Number two, to keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Don't get distracted by the trials of life. And number three, worship God. The best place to worship God is in the house of God, in the local church. We're almost done now. Matthew 14 verse 34. Matthew 14 verse 34. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garments. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. So once again, guys, we see the sick here who place their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says here they were made perfectly whole whole, perfectly whole. How were they made perfectly whole? They had faith on Christ. Okay, They went to see Christ. They went to be in the presence of Christ. They just wanted to touch the hem of His garments and they knew they would be made whole. They had faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what I love about the end of this chapter, it summarizes it all there for us once again. What, are they, what did they have? The faith. They followed after Christ. They had Christ as their focus, didn't they? You know, that they went to be in His presence. You know, and that's why they were healed. That's why they were made perfectly whole. 
Once again, guys, if you want your needs provided for, I don't know what your needs are today. You know, they might be financial. They might be about your relationship. You know, it might be about your, 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 your spiritual growth. Whatever your needs are, the Lord can meet those needs, okay? He just requires you to have faith in Him. He requires you to set your sights on Him. Okay? He requires you to be in His presence to worship Him, all right? You do those things, and I guarantee it, not because of me, but because of what the Bible teaches us, is that your needs will be met, and they'll be met abundantly. All right, let's pray.